Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Joe. Uh, I wanted to reiterate again how sorry I am that all of this has happened and that we have suspended face-to-face -face classroom sessions. Of course, we're biologists, so we know just how devastating this virus can be, and I think we should all take it very seriously and take the social distancing aspect seriously as well. As you know, I went to Bonaire for spring break, and it turns out that once I returned the school, the college requested that I have a 14-day self-quarantine period, and I'm not allowed to step on campus for the next two weeks, which I am in full agreement with. Uh, but it means that I have to try to uh, engage in this online learning experience from home. Fortunately, I'm very interested in online learning, and I probably told you before that I teach an online marine ecology class in the summertime through Providence College. And in the fall, I purchased equipment based on what Sal Khan, the developer of Khan Academy, uses in his amazing tutorials. And he very kindly published what he uses, and I bought equipment very similar to his, and I happen to have that equipment at home. So my hope is to use this equipment, which consists of a drawing tablet, which I just wrote on, a microphone setup, a computer, and an interface to make uh, web-based tutorials. So I'm gonna to try to make these tutorials, and I'm gonna post them on YouTube, and I think that that will be the most effective way to make it through the papers and through the end of the semester. In addition, we'll probably have some online meetings so that we can discuss things and interact a little bit more, but I'm going to need a little bit of time to get up to speed on that. So uh, please be patient. I thank you for that. I thought, of course, I should tell you a story, and I'm particularly sad for the senior class because this is the time of year and the part of their career where they get to celebrate with all of their friends and the people that they've met at PC and their faculty and so on, uh, and sort of celebrate their career, their academic career. And it's really sad that, that we don't get to participate in that aspect. It turns out, I mentioned that I went to a school called the Florida Institute of Technology, and there was a day during my senior, my final spring semester as a senior in January 28th of 1986, it turns out that the school was very close to Cape Canaveral where the space shuttles would take off from. And on January 28th, they had a launch and it was pretty common at that point. So I had seen many launches. You could see the space shuttle. It was big enough uh, that you could see the space shuttle from my college campus. And I had lunch with a friend of mine, Russ, and we came out. We could see the entrails, the water vapor from the space shuttle Challenger. And we realized that it, something wasn't right. So we went to the student union, our version of Slavin, and we watched the TV and realized that the Challenger had exploded. And that particular trip had a special aspect to it. Uh, there was a, a school teacher, a grade school teacher, Krista McAuliffe, who was on board. And it was the first time that a, a civilian and just a normal person was, was in the space shuttle. And of course, all of the people died uh, in that explosion. That evening, the college announced to us, they gathered us in the gymnasium, and they announced that our college campus was gonna close at the end of the semester. The campus I went to wasn't on the main campus in Melbourne, Florida. It was a satellite campus in Jensen Beach. We had a really beautiful college campus right on the Indian River. But at any rate, uh, two things happened on that day. The this, this Space Shuttle Challenger exploded, and we found out that 
our school was going to close at the end of the semester. So um, that was a tough day. I thought to start that I'd show you some footage, some underwater footage from my trip to Bonaire and try to lighten the mood a little bit uh, before we get into neurobiology and uh, start talking about some of the papers. I think we'll have some fun and I want to try to make the end of our semester uh, as successful as the first half and I hope that we can have some fun and learn a little bit more about uh, neurobiology and what we know about how nerve cells in the brain work. So anyway, let me start out by showing you a video. It turns out that I was in Bonaire uh, in 2017 with a bunch of my friends, um, most of whom I met through the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan, where I teach a course in continuing education on the weekends. I, I teach artists how to take photographs with microscopes for art purposes. And I made a little video. It turns out I went diving with uh, a friend of mine, Sebastian, and we had two GoPro cameras, and we came upon this turtle. And I made a little video. I'll show you this, and then we'll get on to neurobiology. So if you go to my website, let's see if I can find my website. joedgeorgis.com I don't know why this is up here. I have to fix that. Uh, but if you go to upcoming expeditions, there's this movie that says The Bonaire Turtle and BFF movie. And it turns out Sebastian and I shot from two different angles. I had a GoPro and was very low looking at the turtle, like in this particular image that you can see at the front of the video. And Sebastian had a second GoPro that he shot from above, and you'll see footage from both of the two cameras. And later on, once we got back, uh, my girlfriend at the time, Aisha Gul Suter, who's a fantastic artist who lives in Istanbul, Turkey, helped me put this movie together. She's very talented and uh, she knows how to edit video and add sound and so on. And uh, anyway, let me show you the video and then I'll show you what I shot this year. This is a green turtle, and we're diving off of a very famous dive site called Salt Pier. He's eating some sort of filamentous algae that's growing in the sand. This is the shot from Sebastian. BFF cowfish and they're just having lunch together. So this footage was captured this year, March 8th, 2020, during Providence College Spring Break. And I'm at the same location that I was before with the turtle and BFF. This is called the Salt Pier in Bonaire. It's a great dive site. And you can see that there's a large barracuda hanging out underneath this fishing boat. I'm trying to sneak up on him and get a photograph and get a video shot. The GoPro has a very wide angle, so I'm actually much closer than it looks, and the Barracuda is not very happy that I'm sneaking up on him.
now some of the light from my underwater video lights strikes him. And he didn't like that, so he kind of slithers away. That was a little too close for comfort. That's our dive group. This is Sadie, she's our dive master, our leader on this dive, and she looks at me and she points to the turtle. And it's in the exact same spot that it was at in 2017, and there's a cowfish, and they're having lunch <laughs> four years later, and they're still eating this filamentous algae. Now, of course, I don't think these are the same. Two, this green turtle is kind of brown, and the other one was very green. They're the same species, it's just they have different color patterns. Um, and I'm sure it's a different cowfish too, but there he is, there's the cowfish. And there's a few other friends this time around. It's a little silver fish, I don't know what he is. I'll have to look him up. And there's Sadie. <laughs> That's it. Pretty funny, huh? The same spot, the same exact behavior. So I thought that was really interesting. It was very fun. Uh, this was the first dive of the trip, and it was really fantastic. I want to show you a couple of other videos because I think um, you'll enjoy them. Okay, in this video there's a parrot fish and a trumpet fish and they're on the right side just going around the, the uh, piling. And I'm going to hide behind the piling because I know they're going to pop out the other side and try to get a video of them. So there they are, and I think the trumpet fish is trying to hide. It's, it's pretending to be part of the parrot fish. Like, hey, you can't see me. I'm, I'm not even here. I'm just, I'm a parrot fish. It's kind of goofy. And then the parrot fish stops to eat some coral, and he kind of knocks off the trumpet fish. And I sneak up to try to get a closer shot. fish takes off and the trumpet fish races after him and climbs back on his back. They're pals. Okay, this is the last video clip I'd like to show you. It turns out Sadie is swimming over the top of the coral reef. And there are many different species of corals there. But on this piling, there's one species of coral which happens to be my favorite, and I wonder if you know why. It's called brain coral. And this one on the right is filled with Christmas tree worms. On the Wednesday before the break, we were reviewing a paper by Marie-Christine Cartier Harlan in a letter to Nature titled, Early Onset Alzheimer's Disease Caused by Mutations at Codon 717 of the Beta Amyloid Precursor Protein. Before we get into the paper, let's review a couple of things that we said about Alzheimer's disease. First of all, there are three different forms the first is called sporadic, and 
it turns out that that occurs very late in life and there's no mutation, there's no genetic mutation associated with that form of the disease. It's sporadic, it happens, we don't know why, uh, and it happens very late in life, usually late 70s, 80s, and 90s. Then there are the heritable or familial forms, and those uh, are early onset. Uh, they can be as early as in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and for those forms of the disease, there is a specific genetic mutation. And, you know, there are many mutations that happen in the amyloid precursor protein, which we're going to talk about, but that's not the only gene that causes the disease. So there, there are others and other mutations that cause the early onset form, and we'll talk about those later on in the course. And then finally, there is a form associated with trisomy 21, which of course we all know is Down syndrome. And it turns out the amyloid precursor protein is located on chromosome 21. So individuals with trisomy 21 have three copies of amyloid precursor protein, or the gene for the protein. And it's thought that perhaps there's a dose effect, that those individuals make more amyloid precursor protein, and that's the condition that leads to uh, AD in those individuals. We also said that the final diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease occurs at autopsy. And if you look at a brain slice of an individual that died of Alzheimer's disease and you stain the piece of tissue, the brain slice, um, you will see these lesions, these scars essentially, uh, and uh, they're called amyloid plaques. And at some point, someone cut these lesions out of the brain slice, and they ran a protein gel. And of course, if you run a protein gel, then you get a banding pattern, and each protein appears as a band based on its molecular weight. And of course, people like to name these different bands. And again, this is called an amyloid plaque, this lesion, and so they call the first band amyloid alpha, and then the next one amyloid beta, and there's probably a gamma, delta, and so on. And it's just a common naming pattern, and at any rate, there was a lot of amyloid beta in these plaques. And if you, someone cuts out, someone cut out that band, and they sequenced its amino acid sequence, or part of it. And so now they know the amino acid sequence of this A beta molecule. And at some point, someone sequenced the RNA molecule that gives rise to this protein. Of course, it's a messenger RNA, and it has a five prime and a three prime end. And they translated the messenger RNA into all six reading frames. They find the longest open reading frame, and then they find the start site, that is the ATG that encodes the amino acid methionine. Or you could use AUG if you want to stay with RNA nomenclature. And then they find the stop codon that terminates translation. And they can then translate the coding sequence into an amino acid sequence. And they get the full length amino acid sequence. And someone realized that this fragment, the A beta fragment, is a portion of this full length translated coding sequence. So this is referred to as the amyloid precursor protein. And somehow this amyloid precursor protein gets cleaved to form this A beta fragment. And the A beta fragment 
is found in high abundance in these amyloid plaques, these lesions in the brain. In the paper, the authors, of course, identify a mutation in amyloid precursor protein that causes early onset Alzheimer's disease in a specific family that they're studying. But that's the conclusion. At the beginning, the scientists didn't know that this family had a mutation in amyloid precursor protein. All they knew was that the family suffered from an early, at, early onset form of AD. And they also knew, based on the inheritance pattern, that the disease followed an autosomal dominant pattern. So it's autosomal dominant. And of course, that infers that there's one good copy and one bad copy of the gene. Uh, you only need one bad copy in order to be afflicted. And it also suggests that that protein is being expressed. The gene that makes the wild type or the good copy of the protein makes enough to do whatever that protein does inside the body. And the bad copy must be expressed in some form, I mean, it's mutated, so it could be truncated or it could just be a single point mutation. But at any rate, that protein must be made in some form because that protein is making the individuals in the family sick. We've also talked about the term penetrance. Penetrance is the percentage of individuals that have the mutation that will ultimately experience the disease. Some genetic diseases are 100% penetrant, meaning that if the individual has the mutated gene, they will ultimately experience the disease. Other genetic disorders have a lower penetrance. Of course, some genetic diseases have a broad range of severity, and there are genetic diseases where you don't experience the disease until a certain period of life, and like Alzheimer's disease. Um, comes on later in life, for instance. Okay, guys, I'm going to stop there for the day. Um, I'm still working out some of the details of how to use the tablet and how to edit the document, edit the footage and all of this and get the sound right and all of that. So I need a little bit more time. I, I thank you for your patience. Um, I'm going to try to keep these videos short. I think I can go through a paper in 20 to 25 minutes. So I'll try to be succinct and to the point. Um, I won't tell you too many goofy stories, although I can't promise that I won't tell you any. <laughs> you know, it's sort of, it's going against my nature not to tell you guys a story. But uh, anyway, I know you have a lot of work and I think it's much more difficult both for the faculty and for you guys to use this format versus all being in the same room and being able to, uh, you know, talk back and forth and ask questions and all that sort of stuff. So, um, so I think at the end of the week, you'll have three videos, one for three papers for the week. Um, I'm hoping that you'll stay up with the reading. I think that's the most important part. Um, you can kind of binge watch the videos at the end of the week. I mean, an hour, an hour and a half is going to get you through all three videos. So it shouldn't be too taxing. And I won't have a lot of irrelevant stuff in there. It'll be, well, this is the important part of the paper. Um, I can't show figures because of copyright issues. So that's a little bit of a problem for me. Uh, but anyway, I'll try to be as clear as I can in my explanation. Um, the test format, at least for exam two, if we're not together, we might, might be together for exam three. I'm not sure yet, but for exam two, uh, the format will be the same. Uh, 12 questions, answer 10. I'm going to email you the document, and then I need you guys to email the document back to me in three hours. I have to limit the exam somehow. Uh, 
but you'll be able to use the papers because there's no way for me to stop you. So to make it fair to everyone, you're going to be able to have the stack of papers with you when you take the exam. So it might be helpful uh, while you're reading the paper to take some notes and use a highlighter and stuff like that. Um, and of course, uh, potentially you might be able to study together through Skype or some other format like that. Um, finally, um, I'm certainly happy to take your phone calls or text messages or emails. I'm still in quarantine, so I can't go to my office or lab at PC. I mean, I can't step on campus and I can't go to the MBL either. So I'm just kind of stuck at home and around the neighborhood. Well, I, well we all are. Um, so if you need anything, please get a hold of me. And uh, I hope you're healthy and safe. And uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow. See you then. Bye-bye.